Dr. Andrew Brown is going to come present some of the work, and he's sort of taken this information and then applied it to some of the patients. Uh, and he is going to be talking about quantifying color vision in disease. Andrew? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks for arranging this awesome meeting. Um, so I'm what stands between you and lunch, uh, so I'll try and make it as as expeditious as possible. So today I'm talking about that same assay that Kimberly just talked about, which was the cone contrast threshold and its use in clinical pop, uh, populations. So uh, disclosures, Conan Medical uh, has given us some devices that we use, and that's, those are the same devices that we use in the, in the data shown in this presentation. So uh, visual uh, processing occurs, of course, as light enters the eye and hits the retina, and then of course it's uh, it goes along the optic nerve, which divides to both hemispheres of the brain, and both eyes have an optic nerve, and then they uh, cross over and synapse in the lateral geniculate nucleus, go through the radiations, and go back to the visual cortex. And so this whole circuit is, is relevant for how we process vision, which of course includes color. Um, most of the time that we talk about clinical color vision evaluation, it's in the context of achromatopsia, people with uh, deficiencies of color uh, of a specific type, or people with optic neuropathies. So talking about color vision in the context of maybe retina or anterior segment glaucoma is not a very common thing that we do, uh, but I'll show you some of the experience that, that I've had over the last year in evaluating color in our patients. So again, this is largely focusing on the retina, the orange tissue shown in that eye. So the retina real estate is quite valuable and very small. If we uh, put a postage stamp next to a diagram of the retina, this is actually to scale. A postage stamp is about, as, about a third of our, of our retinal area. It's a tiny, tiny area. Um, and so this is a color picture of, of my eye here with the optic nerve, the blood vessels coming off of it, the fovea, and then the peripheral vision, which would be in the peripheral retina over here. The fovea, which is the, where the, uh, the majority of our visual perception comes from, is also where color vision comes from. And so this 1.5 millimeter diameter circle in the middle of our eye is responsible for most of our vision. And if we take a cross section through that 1.5 millimeter eye on the OCT, we can see the foveal umbo and the depression here, which is where we have this very high density information uh, of light being converted into neurological signals. So 1% of the retina is fovea, less than, less than that, and half of the information that gets back to our visual cortex comes from that 1%. If you want to know, have a scale idea of how big this fovea is, a fine ballpoint pen is about 0.5 to 0.8 millimeters in diameter. And if you draw that onto the fovea, it covers almost the whole fovea. So it's a really, really tiny piece of tissue in our body that's responsible for our visual acuity as well as a lot of our color vision. So the tests that we use clinically, uh, routinely every single day, uh, to measure visual function include, everybody's probably read letters in the, in the chart, which is black and white letters. Uh, which is ETDRS and Snellen visual acuity. The visual, acu the, uh, visual fields are, qu are quantified on a display like this, but a visual field is white light on a, on, on a generally slightly less white background or blue on yellow, um, or yellow on blue. And then also uh, the Amsler grid, which is a grid pattern which people look for changes in the form of their vision, uh, metamorphopsia. <coughs> And so if we project these onto the, uh, onto the actual eye, we can see that the visual field tests a very small part of the retina. The Amsler grid tests an even smaller part of the retina. And actually, when you overlay the 2020 to 2400 uh, letters onto the fovea, it's even a smaller area. But this is all black on white, or white uh, high contrast visual uh, assessment. And so if we look at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, that's what we would look like if we were testing the vision the way that we test our uh, t testing vision on a routine basis in our clinics. But we see the world in color, and so I think it's relevant to, to think very seriously, be, seriously about how it is that we measure vision. And so if we look at the, uh, the, the anatomy of the fovea, which is in this red circle over here, we can see on histology that there are all cones, very tiny, skinny little cones. And if we come out to this blue circle, there are cones, but now they've actually changed shape. So they go from being really skinny to really fat, and in the periphery they become even more fat. And everything in between here are actually the rods. Adaptive optics allows us to see this in, in uh, living subjects rather than having to take a histological sample. And so all of these very fine cones are highly packed and dense, and they're all responsible for our color vision in our fovea. Interestingly enough, the distribution is not uniform. In fact, in the central part of our fovea, there are no blue cones. 
and then the green and reds are, are distributed fairly evenly. So if we take a diagrammatic cross-section of the retina, we can see that there are rods and three different uh, conopsins. And in primates, these are encoded on these different chromosomes where the red-green color blindness is encoded on the X chromosome. And the rod and the, and the uh, short wavelength opsin are on the, th on the third and seventh chromosome. People often ask, what do animals see um, in terms of, of their visual experience? And so here are cross-sections of different species. Here's a zebrafish uh, where you can see that there are, uh, there are actually uh, five different cones and rods as well. And then chicks have a different set of wavelengths that they see. And then you have mice and sheep, which have very few cones and majority of rods. And then, of course, other, uh, other animals as well coming to the primates. So all of these animals here in the top and the bottom, these are these cone-dominant species. And then the rod-dominant species are typically mice and cattle, rodents and cattle. If you look at the distribution in these different species, they have, um, not, not all of them have a fovea. So we are uh, unique in that we have a highly concentrated cluster of cones in the central part of our vision, whereas other animals might have a horizontal streak uh, or a, a clustering of cones in the superior part of their retina. Of course, I'm most interested in, in humans because that's who I care for, um, but we also uh, grow anim uh, hu human stem cell derived <laughs> organoids in a petri dish in our laboratory setting, and so we are looking to study cone sensitivity in these model systems. And of course, zebrafish as well, uh, looking at their uh, retinal structure and function and responsivity to color. So, color vision testing in the clinic. Most people have probably encountered these color plates, which are um, testing for red-green uh, color discrepancy or deficiency and blue-yellow. And uh, typically there's maybe eight to 12 different of these uh, numbers that are shown to someone and then they respond if they can see them. And this is a great screening tool for deficiency in color sensitivity, but not really very quantitative. The farnsworth munsell is an arrangement test where colors are arranged across the spectrum of the rainbow and then you look for errors in that arrangement. This test is quantitative, but it takes 20 to 30 minutes, so it's really not practical uh, in a clinical setting. And then finally, the anomaloscope is a test where you compare the combination of green and red to a reference yellow and try to determine how much error there is between the combination of green and, and red to the yellow. But again, this is another 20 to 30 minute test that's not practical uh, in, the, in the clinical context. So Dr. Jameson has already shown us how the cone contrast threshold works. It's very, uh, very useful in this, in this format because it's basically a highly calibrated computer screen that uh, can control exactly how bright these different letter Cs are presented to a patient and provides a, for, uh, a format in terms of the data presentation where you can see the individual sensitivities of the uh, red, green, and blue opsins in, in human subjects in each of their eyes. So to validate this first, Clara Yu, who's a medical student at Western University last summer, uh, made sure that we had a protocol that was appropriate for using this test. And so we tested human subjects uh, in the clinic under various conditions, undilated, dilated, with varying degrees of uh, optical filters, basically stronger sunglasses, and then through pinholes. And the pinhole is, uh, is relevant because it's a way of neutralizing a refractive error. And uh, we wanted to make sure that if we had someone with a high refractive error and we had them looking through a pinhole that it didn't affect their color vision. So the data is as such. And, and so what we found was that the, humans, that the, the human subjects had nor normal eyes, needed to have the, uh, an undilated state in order to have reliable tests. You can see with dilation, you have larger error bars, although still normal, uh, normal measurements in this gray area. As you increase the, uh, the density of the filters, you of course have a decline in the sensitivity, but also when you look through pinholes, there's a lot of error and actually a deficiency or a borderline deficiency in, in color um, perception. So testing patients has to be in a non-medriatic state uh, using this cone contrast threshold test. And so uh, I'll show you a variety of different disease states now. Uh, the first is going to be multiple sclerosis, which is a disease that can affect the whole visual pathway. Uh, and this is the, the condition that is most commonly associated with actually testing color vision in a clinical context. And then I'll show a variety of different diseases affecting the retina and how, uh, how color vision changes in these diseases. So with macular degeneration and epiretinal membrane, as well as retinal vein occlusion, uh, each affecting different layers of the retina in different ways. And then I'll show an example of, uh, of how a cataract also affects color vision and uh, how that changes after a cataract surgery. So multiple sclerosis is this demyelinating disease that affects the whole visual pathway. So if, you can be, if the visual pathway is affected at any point, it's hard to know exactly 
um, where it is just based on a single test like color vision testing. But because multiple sclerosis is the test where we routinely do show these color plates to assess color vision perception, um, this is a, a great starting point. And so in multiple sclerosis, there is early color vision loss, whether or what you do or don't have a history of optic neuritis. And so uh, the way that we wanted to compare um, the, uh, the structure of the nerve with color vision was by performing an OCT where we can look at the thickness of the nerve fibers converging into the uh, optic nerve head. And we compared that, the findings from that with uh, the findings from color vision testing. And so uh, what we see here are we had 15 subjects with multiple sclerosis, 15 subjects who were normal healthy controls, uh, age matched. And we can see that there were patients who, uh, that were normal healthy had normal levels uh, for each of their, of their cone sensitivities. People who had in these middle bars for each of the different colors uh, had multiple sclerosis but with a normal nerve fiber layer. And we can see that in the green and blue cones there was a statistically significant difference between, uh, between those groups. And then finally in people who actually had an effect on their optic nerve, something that was measurable structurally, there was a much greater decrement in the sensitivity for, for each color. So of course we expect to see a color vision deficiency in multiple sclerosis um, because we've, uh, we've been using that as a, as a screening tool for changes for many years. In macular degeneration, um, this is the number one cause of vision loss in people over 50 in, in the U.S. And of course, we've probably seen many pictures like this where you have drusen throughout the macula, drusen underneath the retina, um, as shown on OCT. And the change that, that can occur is an ampular grid appears like this and can become distorted with decreased contrast sensitivity as well. So with different uh, stages of macular degeneration, of course, this is a, a healthy eye. In early macular degeneration, you can have a few little punctate areas of drusen with some small drusen underneath the, underneath the, uh, the macula. In intermediate, we start to have many more drusen underneath the, the macula and distributed throughout the macula. And so someone may start to have decreased contrast sensitivity with macular degeneration in the early and intermediate stages. But visual acuity may not be affected at all. And then finally, we have advanced macular degeneration where you can have visual acuity loss, distortion, um, and so that, that has two different subtypes, atrophic or wet advanced macular degeneration, where you have complete loss of the photoreceptors, and then also a wet uh, a neovascular macular degeneration, uh, where again you have a, a loss of visual function. So these are the visually, visual impairments where you will, would expect to see a change on Amsler grid, uh, where you would expect to see a change in visual acuity. And so um, here's an example of one of my patients, 94-year-old, who's had cataract surgery in both eyes, 2040 and 2020. Uh, here are the images of his, of his eyes showing uh, many drusen, these little white flecks throughout the retina, an area of geographic atrophy uh, in the right eye. Um, but the visual acuity is actually quite good. And then if you look at the autofluorescence, we can see areas where you can see, see extensive uh, atrophy around uh, the fovea in this eye and uh, getting closer to the fovea in the other eye. And um, and this, so this, of course, is age-related macular degeneration. The OCT looks uh, very different from normal. And what, what is their, this patient's color vision uh, sensitivity? So as it turns out, he can see almost nothing with his right eye, which is apparently 2040, but he can see almost nothing. So his experience of the world with his right eye is very different. And his left eye, which is seeing 2020, great by our, our routine uh, evaluation, is actually deficient in all different cone classes. And so um, when the patient actually says, when I look at these colored boxes with my right eye, they all appear black. So we looked at, uh, at subjects with differing degrees of macular degeneration from early, intermediate to advanced forms and compared them to uh, normal, normal healthy age match controls. And of course we see that in the intermediate uh, form of the disease, uh, there is a, a statistically significant difference in the blue and, and red cone classes. And then in the advanced form of the disease, there's statistical significance across all cone classes. And this confirms what is published last year by Ladd et al. demonstrating that intermediate macular degeneration is associated with a decline in color vision sensitivity, whereas we still cannot detect it on early phases of the disease. But all clinical trials at this point have been focused on wet and dry advanced forms of the disease. And we don't have metrics other than visual acuity that are routinely used to look at changes in visual perception. So it's truly seeing a difference in intermediate macular degeneration it provides to us a new uh, target for a clinical endpoint for measuring changes in function uh, in the context of treatment or not. 
Retinal vein occlusion is a vascular disease, essentially a stroke of the eye, where you might have uh, hemorrhages within the retina, uh, decreased blood flow in the superior part of this example of, of the retina, and on the OCT, you can have extensive swelling of the retina as well with a decline in, in, uh, in visual acuity. Here's a patient of mine, 2060, when they presented, um, 2020 in the other eye, and after treatment, normalizing the anatomy as much as possible, they got to 2030, and uh, in the other eye remained 2015 or so. And so the question was, how much color vision sensitivity did they have? So despite being 2030, they had very low color vision sensitivity, whereas their other eye was a little bit closer to normal. So looking at uh, 10 sub uh, uh, humans uh, who had decreased uh, vision in, their, in one of their eyes and comparing that to their fellow eye, we see that um, for the uh, vein occlusion eye, in all, in all uh, cone options, there was a decline that was statistically significant compared to their fellow eye. Epiretinal membranes are a condition that we treat surgically, and uh, epiretinal membranes is a proliferation of fibrocellular material on the surface of the macula. And you can see these blood vessels here being distorted. So there's mechanical stresses that are conveyed to the, from this uh, scar tissue to the surface of the, of the retina. And these can be graded from stage one through four where you have increasing degrees of distortion of the normal uh, macular anatomy. And so looking at, the, um, at epiretinal membranes and, and how they affect color vision and comparing them to control eyes, um, we see that there is a kind of a heterogeneity in terms of which opsins are most affected. Certainly the red opsin is most affected in, in this group of patients that we had 34. Um, in, in the more advanced form of, of epiretinal membrane, we have loss of the foveal contour. We had more green opsin uh, deficiency. And then uh, with a more advanced stage three uh, epiretinal membrane, uh, two cone classes were affected. So this may present to us uh, an opportunity to try and quantify uh, changes in, in macular function uh, before and after, after epiretinal membrane surgery. Uh, here's an example of one of my patients who has uh, an epiretinal membrane, and you can see there's a clear uh, difference between the two eyes in their sensitivities. So why is color vision affected in epiretinal membranes? We have a membrane on the surface of the retina. The photoreceptors are at the bottom of the retina. They're not directly in contact. Um, and so there may be a, a variety of, of, of mechanisms. Uh, could be through mechanical stress that are transmitted from the surface of the retina down to the photoreceptor level. Or it could be altered waveguide properties of Mueller cells. And so Mueller cells are extremely interesting cells because they basically are fiber optics that live in the, in the retina. And, um, and one of the, the phenomena known as the Stiles Crawford effect of the first kind um, is, is affects the intensity and brightness that one sees in the retina depending on the angle of illumination. So if you take a piece of, t of retina out of, out of a cadaver eye and you shine light on it, the amount of light that comes through that piece of tissue through the fovea, is de it differs depending on the angle of illumination. So if it's perpendicular, all the light comes through. If it's at a five degree or 10 degree angle, less light comes through. So there's a very important fiber optic pro uh, process that occurs of guiding light from the inner retina to the photoreceptors, and that could possibly explain some of the color vision changes that we see. This has also been validated in, in, uh, in, uh, in humans who uh, were presented with stimuli at different, differing angles on this horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis we see their relative sensitivity. So angles of, of light, coming from, light coming from different angles can have a decrease or increase in, um, in luminance intensity. The Stiles Crawford effect of the second kind is the chromatic variety where you have incident light at 90 degrees, it's perceived as it should be, and if it comes at a different angle, it has a different color perception. So looking at the Mueller's as a waveguide, um, if we extract the Mueller cells and put them into an experimental apparatus, this was published um, back in 2007, this is an isolated Mueller cell, there's an optical source and an optical detector, and when the Mueller cell is aligned perfectly between those, uh, the source and detector, you have almost all of the light being guided from the source to the detector. And when the cell is removed, again, the light's still shining at the detector, but it doesn't get coupled perfectly to the detector. So the Mueller cell is essentially acting, acting as a fiber optic. The Mueller cells have also been shown in, in models to be coupled directly uh, to the green and, and red cone class uh, in terms of which cone class they favor to direct light to, toward. And this has been validated again, of course, in experimental models as well, where the red and green cone classes um, are, are most sensitive to Mueller alignment. 
Finally, uh, Marjan Farid had a case last year where we had preoperative and postoperative cataract surgery evaluation of color uh, sensitivity. Of course, we always hear patients saying, yes, the world seems so much more vibrant and the colors are so much more saturated. And so um, using uh, CCT, uh, we, in this one case, uh, studied how the patient's color vision changed, and we're planning to do a prospective study over the summer uh, for both epiretinal membrane as well as for cataract surgery. So in conclusion, even in patients who have good visual acuity, 2020, 2030, 2040, um, these cone contrast threshold tests reveal deficits, uh, which we are ignoring in terms of how we manage patients and, and, and have clinical endpoints. And this is true for multiple sclerosis, epiretinal membrane, macular degeneration, and vein occlusion. Uh, and CCT appears to be an important clinical endpoint that we could use in, in clinical trials. But the main challenges uh, that, we're, that we experience from a practical standpoint of using it in the clinic is that it's a t seven to 15 minute test and a lot of patients who are oftentimes older say it's a very challenging test to take. So our experience with the existing uh, version of CCT kind of informs how we would look forward to designing new implementations for assessing color vision in, in our patients. Uh, finally, I'll just touch briefly on, um, on an alternative way which uh, is being presented now. And we're actually very lucky to have the Palczewski group having joined us because there may be an entirely different way of probing color vision without using color light whatsoever, using infrared light. Um, if, you, if anybody's ever looked at a, at a remote control for a TV, you can't see the light flashing usually. And so that's because we're, our lights are not sensitive to infrared light. But um, what I'll describe to you now is a little bit about microperimetry and how microperimetry can be used for, uh, infrared light can be used in microperimetry. So microperimetry is where you have uh, the retina in cross-section here and beams of light are shown onto, are, are shown onto very small focal areas. And so we, cr we create this map of sensitivity to light. And so for example over here, this is in the green area and this, uh, this focal point is more sensitive than this focal point over here in the uh, yellow to oranges area. And so it's a way of probing uh, very precisely look, uh, different areas of the retina for its sensitivity. And so this is with the Palczewski group. They've developed a two-photon mic uh, uh, microperimeter as part of the Audacious Goals initiative. And so what they've demonstrated is that with a test pattern being shown across the visible spectrum into an eye, if, it goes through, if the pattern goes through a cataract, then there's a lot of diffusion and dispersion of light. And so the pattern is essentially lost. Whereas if it goes through clear media, of course the pattern is recapitulated once it gets through uh, uh, to, to the retina. When, and with infrared light, because infrared light tends to penetrate all tissues so much more easily than visible spectrum, when it passes through, the, through a diffusion-like media like a cataract, the pattern is recapitulated and it's very similar to the pattern that is seen, with, um, seen, seen without any, any uh, diffusing media. So the question is, can we stimulate vision with infrared light? Well, we can't not just normally with everyday light. None of us are seeing infrared light very much right now, unless there's a quattrochromat or multichromat that has visual sensitivity and maybe gene, gene editing in the future will allow us to do that sort of thing. Um, but for now, we can't. And so um, conventional white light microperimetry does suffer from some of this diffusion where larger focal areas of, of the retina can be stimulated. And with uh, infrared two-photon ophthalmoscopy, where pulsed lasers are directed to very small focal volumes and the infrared light itself is not uh, dispersed, in principle, one can very reliably probe small areas of the retina. And so what, what their group has shown is that as the stimulus wavelength increases, this is all in the infrared spectrum, about um, the sensitivity for, from this pulsing laser uh, can be detected as, as a specific color. So here's the visible spectrum on the y-axis. And so people who uh, are pulsed with infrared light of, on the 1.2 micron wavelength, they perceive light about a half of that wavelength. So 1,200 divided by two is about 600. So in principle, you can use infrared light of different wavelengths using these pulsed laser sources to probe the retina very sensitively and, and also stimulate, stimulating each of the individual cone classes, uh, possibly independently. So um, in terms of future directions, we do plan to continue to use cone contrast thresholding uh, in clinical disease and also in perioperative um, testing for uh, cataract and epiretinal membrane surgery. Um, the two-photon visual function testing in patients with disease will be starting this summer. Um, and, we will be, and I'm recruiting patients, and, and we're recruiting patients from uh, throughout our clinic with varying different types of diseases. And we're also hoping to develop faster testing strategies for evaluating color vision because I believe that it is something important that we shouldn't be ignoring in our routine clinical care. 
And I'd like to acknowledge the Institute for Clinical and Translational Science who supports um, my salary and a lot of our work uh, with, with stats analysis, Conan Medical for de uh, providing the devices, um, the, the medical students from here at UCI as well as um, at Medical College of Wisconsin and, uh, and Western University who spent the summer last year, uh, we're all working together to capture this data on clinical subjects. And then, of course, Chris Kenny and, and Kimberly Jameson and, and one of my partners, Mithil Metza, Chantal Boisvert, and uh, Wade Crow, who uh, invited us to participate with their, their patient populations. Um, and I'll take any questions. I, no, we don't have that, um, that population characterized yet, no. But um, I have had one patient who had macular edema um, who did have an improvement in their color sensitivity. Uh, but I would presume that, you know, in the context of macular edema or vein occlusion from diabetes or macular edema from vein occlusion or diabetes, the uh, color sensitivity is probably affected largely by dispersion by the fluid within the, within the retina rather than a, a true change necessarily in uh, visual processing. But... We may be able to answer that question actually a little bit more accurately with tests like the two-photon infrared um, yeah. technique. Right, so right now we're, we rely on things that are similar to the Amsler grid, looking for distortion and that sort of things. Maybe a, a visual acuity decline, but certainly that's part of what we hope to do is to develop um, you know, more practical tools that are probably are based on, on uh, LCD displays, so anybody with their cell phone can evaluate their, their visual function. Yeah, that's one of the challenges in color vision testing is that it's a non-localizing test, of course, you know, starting at the photoreceptors, possibly to the different types of ganglion cells. Right now, there's nothing that I'm aware of in terms of looking at even magnocellular versus parvocellular projections and even dividing that down even further to smaller groups. Um, I think that uh, when you start thinking about these other types of ganglion cells, we have to present ne maybe not necessarily st um, static stimuli, but uh, kind of dynamic stimuli to try and uh, tap into those different processing mechanisms. Yeah, so um, certainly it's, it, color vision testing is useful in, in diagnosis. Um, in terms of clinical endpoints for treatments, uh, you know, for example, we look at intermediate macular degeneration, where visual acuity may not be affected. Of course, the OCT can be affected, but we're not really tapping into the patient's visual perception and experience. Um, so right now, we're, we, a lot of the trials that are dedicated towards dry macular degeneration are looking purely at structural changes within the eye. Um, and, and not looking at changes or preservation of visual function. So in, in my, you know, from a clinical standpoint, using color vision as a way of preserving uh, visual function over time would be the, the primary target. Uh, you know, using a, t a test like the Color DX, uh, you can, similarly to glaucoma uh, progression analysis, plot progression of color vision decline. So, you know, because there are really no other mainstream color vision assays in a clinical context that are quantitative, um, you know, this is, this in, in my mind is the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for us to kind of focus on. And I think we're going to stop there. If, uh, I'm sure there are more questions, but please uh, ask them over lunch. Uh, and I want to thank all the speakers and all the participants. <laughs>